been talking for a while. Interesting, does anyone disagree with anything that's being said from a Middle Eastern perspective? You're such a lovely bunch of people. I don't disagree with anything. Yes, Please. thank you very much. Your point about marketing teams being either too bought into being audited out yes. or dated out yes. is, is fair. How do you build that team? Because usually the... Uh, how do you build that team if you're a giant company? And how do you build that team if you're a, a small company where your marketing team is one, maybe two people? Yeah. Because the creative, the creative people don't want to talk or think that they're too cool for the data people and the data people think that they're too smart for the creative people. You know, it's really fun. I, I don't get the luxury of traveling with Claude Silber who's sitting back here who's our chief heart officer which sits on top of all of our HR. But if when people ask me, like, you know, so I do this and we'll have a meeting and once in a while somebody will grab me or after dinner, after the meeting, they're like, okay, I understand, but like, how are you actually doing this? And the, there's really only two answers. One, through HR. To your point, it's taken us a good five years now of really pounding being the bigger person, being empathetic, being kind, because it is in the meetings of some, you know, listen, if you're a creative director who's worked at the fancy shops for 17 years and you're finally a GCD at Vayner and you have all the say and now all of a sudden you have a 23 year old MIT math kid telling you you're wrong, that takes a level of empathy and buy-in to what we're trying to achieve that is very difficult. First of all, most shops in the world aren't 300 people deep in both media and creative under one roof in a non-holding company environment. So we're unique from day one. I didn't even realize it was unique. I was building it for myself if I buy Evian or Nike or what have you. And so that's one, the uniqueness of the DNA. But that is what everybody's gonna have to do. And the answer to your question is HR. You're gonna have to have human conversations. When you tell a math person that if math was the only way to do marketing, it would have been over a long time ago, or if you tell an art person that if you don't factor in the fact that we have so much more data than we did 20 years ago and you completely disregard it, you tell both of them they're vulnerable and then you actually act on it. Our strength has come from actually firing some of our best people who haven't been able to buy into the humility and empathy needed to be successful. And then what happens is volume takes over. Let me tell you why volume will change your life. When you're making 6,000 pieces of content and you actually think they're meaningful, an Instagram, a Facebook, a YouTube post, not just the TV, if you get everybody to believe they're valuable, well, as you can imagine, no longer does a strategist or a creative have to play political because she is not worried that it's the only thing that's coming out. When she's able to get all 800 of her ideas out into the world, she's not against an account person or my favorite or the client. The biggest breakthrough for us is our clients are more involved than ever because their idea in the shower that they send in on Slack or text is made within 72 hours, but it was about driving down the cost of that creative to make it feasible for the budgets that people have, but it's really, it's HR that makes it possible. Go ahead. But how about if you're a small company? If 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 you're starting off with one or two people? Talent. But it takes a lot of drive. You have to keep on going through a lot of people in order to get there, no? Sure. But what's your alternative? <laughs> you know, and I, and I also would look at, I think you, you can look at comps. I think, silico, I think startups, direct-to-consumer startups, have the most natural DNA for art and math because that's all they know. When you look at Movement or Gymshark or, you know, or Fashion Nova or Purple Mattress, it's been math and art. And if, you know, and I see you shaking your head, what's fascinating about Facebook and Instagram is they look at their data and they're like, my God, who are these companies spending $4 million a week in ads on Instagram? You know, when you look at their data on the back end, it's a very fascinating thing that's going on. The biggest spenders are people you've never heard of but you're about to hear of in 24 months. And then you've got the biggest companies. I mean, you literally have. I, I, I laugh with when some, like sometimes I'll get like a cryptic email from somebody from Facebook or Instagram. They're like, keep it up, you're right. You know, like, you know, it's like from a Gmail account. They're like, they don't even, it's not even from their work account. And they'll, and they'll, and they'll say things like, Gary, it's crazy, you're right. Like, like Mercedes has spent, we, we, have a, we have a Thai company spending more money this week than Mercedes will spend this year. This is these moments. Guys, Amazon was the biggest spender on Google AdWords in the first six years. If you look, Procter & Gamble was the biggest spender on television in the first decade. When there is underpriced attention, 
the biggest spenders become the leaders of the next generation. And then they become high on that supply so they can't see the next thing. 